Adhikarna 10. The soul follows the rays of the sun. Sutra 18. Rashmyanusari. Rashima Anusari. By following the rays of the sun. Translation. The soul of the man of knowledge proceeds by following the rays of the sun. Starting with the sentence, Now then, there is the palace of Brahman in the shape of the tiny lotus of the heart that is within the body. In that exists Brahman called the small inner space. Chandogya 8.1.1 A meditation about the heart is enjoined. In the course of describing this meditation, the start is made with, Now these nerves of the heart, Chandogya 861, and then a connection is elaborately shown between the nerves in the heart and the rays of the sun in the passage, Then when anyone departs from this body thus, he goes up along these rays, Chandogya 865, and again it is stated, Going up through that nerve, one gets immortality. Chandogya 866. From this it is known that the soul, while emerging through the hundred and first nerve, goes out along the rays. Now the doubt arises as to whether the soul follows the rays equally, irrespective of the occurrence of the death during the daytime or night, or it does so only when dying in the daytime. Vedantin. This being the doubt, the aphorist declares that the soul progresses by the way of the rays, irrespective of the time of death, for the Upanishad speaks in general terms. Sutra 19. Nishicheti chena sambandhasya yavadeha bhavitvat darshaya ticha. Nishi, in the night. Na, there is no progress along the rays. Itichet, if it be argued thus, then na, not so. Yavat deha bhavitvat, since there is a continuance as long as the body lasts. Sambandasya, of the relationship between the nerve and the rays, cha, also. Darshayati, the Upanishad reveals this. Translation, if it be argued that the soul departing at night can have no progress along the rays, then it is not so, since the connection between the nerve and the rays continues as long as the body lasts, and this is revealed in the Upanishad. Opponent, the nerve and the sun's rays remain connected during the day, so that a man dying in the day may well follow the rays in his upward course. But that is not possible for a man dying at night, because the connection between the nerve and the rays is then snapped. Vedanta, not so, for the connection between the nerve and the rays lasts as long as the body itself, for the nerve and the rays remain in association as long as the embodied state continues. The connection is not broken by night. This fact is revealed by the Upanishad in Extending from that solar orb, they, the rays, enter into the nerves, and spreading out from the nerves, they enter the solar orb. Chandogya 862 in summer, the presence of the rays, even during nights, is perceived from their effect of producing heat, etc. If it is difficult to perceive them during the nights in other seasons, it is because they are present in very small measures, even as they are in cloudy days during winter. The text, The sun makes of it a day even at night, reveals this very fact. Were a man dying at night to proceed upward even without following the rays, the pursuit of the rays itself would become useless. The Upanishad does not mention separately that those who die in the daytime proceed upward by following the rays, while those who die at night do so without depending on the rays. 
On the contrary, if it be supposed that even a man of knowledge cannot proceed upward owing to the offense of his dying at night, then the fruit of knowledge will become uncertain, so that men will have no inducement to it, for one cannot regulate the time of one's death. It cannot be that a soul that has become detached from the body at night must wait till day dawns. For even when day dawns, its body may not come in contact with the solar rays, it, the body, having already been consigned to fire, etc. The text, in the little time that the mind takes to travel from one object to another, the man of knowledge reaches the sun. Chandogya 8, 6, 5 also shows that there is no waiting for daybreak. Therefore, the soul's pursuit of the rays is the same, whether it departs at night or in the day. Namaste. So these sutras are pretty straightforward. When the soul leaves the body at death of an enlightened being, huh? not a conditioned being, the enlightened beings travel on the sun rays. Now, how is this possible? How can you travel on a ray? Well, we do it all the time. Every time you pick up your phone or log into the internet, the information travels by light through fiber cables. So in the same way, the information of the soul, which is the uh, background information from the previous lives, the karma that brings him to liberation, that information travels along the sun rays just like a modulated light beam can transmit any amount of information through a cable. But these beams are free. They're open. They're not enclosed in some man-made pipe. <laughs> but they are the energy that sustains the entire biosphere. The sun's energy, gravity, and so on, is what creates the planet that we live on. And its energy transmitted through light is what animates the entire world of life, organic life that we know of. This thin film of organic, growing, uh, evolving, <laughs> conscious stuff that we call life. So, this is a very precious thing. This is a, a very influential thing, this light from the sun. The light from the sun and the gravity of the moon is what causes the, the mix. Huh? It's like a big blender <laughs> that mixes all these different substances and gives the raw materials for the bodies to be animated by the information coming through the sunbeams. See, that's why Vedic astrology is called Jyotish. Jyoti means light, and Isha means God. So God controls the universe by light. And the sun's light is the medium through which that control passes in both ways. The outgoing light from the sun is what programs the whole biosphere and implements the law of karma and so on. And the returning information from exiting of the souls from their material bodies is a kind of feedback mechanism. Uh -huh. And, of course, the sun is very happy to receive enlightened souls from the planet Earth because the whole purpose of this universe is self-realization. Now, why is that? Well, this is something very esoteric that I found buried deeply in one of Shankaracharya's commentaries that Brahman 
cannot see itself directly. Huh? How can one know the knower? Says Yajnavalkya. <laughs> so the knower cannot know itself directly. It can know that it exists. It can know that it is conscious, but it cannot see itself from the point of view of another, because in Brahman there is no other. There is no object, there is no second. One without a second is Brahman. So to get an idea of itself as an entity, Brahman creates Maya, and Maya is like a mirror. And it is said that Shiva is Brahman's reflection in Maya. Uh -huh. So through Shiva and the many, many living entities that expand from him in his creation, Brahman gets a look at itself in the mirror of the creation. That includes each and every living being, all of us. Huh? And that gives Brahman the same kind of self-realization as we experience when we realize, Aham Brahmasmi, I am Brahman. I am that consciousness, that central energy or force or being, uh, that sat chit ananda, eternal conscious bliss, that is the root cause of everything. So when we realize this, this is a tremendous awakening for us. And then when we leave this illusory body, huh? this temporary shell, this bag of bones. <laughs> when we leave this behind and return through the light to the sun, the sun is immensely pleased. Now, one of the problems today is that not many people are becoming enlightened. For example, in the Buddha's teaching, he taught how in the beginning, like 500 years after his appearance, people would use his teaching to become enlightened. But after that, the whole thing would start to degenerate until after a thousand years or so after his appearance, nobody would be getting enlightened. And that's exactly what happened. So the Buddhists of today have reconciled themselves that nobody's going to get enlightened by following our path. And so they simply concentrate on making merit. They call it good karma, subha karma, so that they take a birth in a high planet in the next life and thereby gain the opportunity to further their self-realization. But wait a minute, the Vedic path, the Upanishadic path is still alive is still functioning, is still capable of bestowing the highest benefit. Well, why doesn't everybody take shelter of it? Well, <laughs> they're ignorant, they're prejudiced, they're attached, <laughs> they're lusty, and they don't want to give up their big positions in religious organizations and stuff like that, or in politics, or in economics. huh? They don't want to become a poor sadhu. Huh? They want to own a condo in Miami Beach. <laughs> well, whatever they're attached to. But it doesn't make any difference. They still have to die. And if after death, your soul is washed away by the gravitational waves of the moon, well, you may get to enjoy a little heavenly delight you know, depending on the karma, uh, the pious karma that you have created. In today's society, materialists perform all kinds of terrible sinful actions, beginning with eating meat, which is cruelty to animals. 
with no real redemption from pious activities. Because why? Scientific so-called materialistic atheism has become the dominant belief system all over the world through Western culture. So Western culture has used its economic power to broadcast its values to the rest of the world. And like even here in Sri Lanka, the Catholic Church is doing very well. Huh? They're not the dominant religion, but they are quite well established. So even though these big religious institutions can find a lot of support among people, it's only because they actually throw away the spiritual knowledge that comes from Vedic culture, and they concentrate on morality, and which, of course, is a material thing, a material concept. What is moral and right in one society or culture in one part of the world at a certain time in history may be considered immoral and wrong and, you know, punishable by the law in another time and place. So what is this morality? It's just another temporary conditioning. So if the basis of religion is morality and a little token worship of God, you know, on Sunday morning or whatever, that is not going to result in liberation. That is going to result in taking the path to the moon and getting the results of your karma, good or bad, and then coming back again to be put in the same position. Well, what is this? What am I doing here? What should I do? How can I get out? Why am I suffering? Why is there evil in the world? And so on. So you have to resolve all these questions. And this is the Brahma Vidya, the knowledge about Brahman contained in the scriptures. And if you follow the instructions given in the Brahma Vidya, then you get Brahma Jnana, realized knowledge of Brahman. And of course, that will set you up for liberation. Then at the time of death, the heart's door will illuminate, you will pass through it onto the rays of the sun, which are present even in the darkest night, huh? in some small quantity, or else we'd have an ice age here, like we did what is it, millions or thousands of years ago on Earth. The rays of the sun keep us warm even at night. So, we can follow those rays back to their source, back to the sun planet. And from there, we become pure light and merge with the eternal Brahman. Aum Tat Sat. Aum Shakti Aum. Aum Namah Shivaya.